Ladies and gentlemen, just before we start another episode of the Fitness Academy podcast, just a reminder for those who are listening on YouTube that we are now on Spotify. So please head down into the link in the description and check us out there. On with the episode. If, you, if you're lucky enough to even be able to put a ball in your hand and bowl it, just count your blessings and just be, appreciate that you're able to do something that millions and millions of people would wish and pray that they can do. Uh, honestly, that, for me, that's the best piece of advice because regardless of the level you get to it just keeps you grounded and it, it, it that's what helps me sort of keep going Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Fitness Academy podcast. Uh, this has been a long time coming, team, and you'll understand why when you get to the end of this podcast. So, gratefully joined here by Shabazz Chowdhury, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries. So, uh, if you don't know who he is, he's obviously, I'll let him get into it in a little bit, but he's obviously founder of the Peace Journal, which is obviously something that I follow quite closely and have done for a long time. Obviously, helping an extraordinary amount of young cricketers and cricketers as a whole uh, achieve what they want to achieve and help them bowl faster, help them be stronger, both mentally and physically as well. That's important to say. So, but before we get into any of that serious stuff, mate, I'm I'm going to be a complete child here and uh, ask you a little bit of an icebreaker question. So I always ask this to my the professional sportsman that I have on. Um, as a fast bowler, and I know personally, I used to have a hell of a lot of superstitions when I was younger. Mate, making sure I put my left boot on first, making sure that I had two socks on the left foot and one sock on the right foot to make sure my landing foot was perfect. Did you or have you still got any superstitions before your bowl, after your bowl, during your bowl? That's a, that's a very good question, to be fair. Um, I guess I have like a, a ritual. I mean, call, if you want to call it a superstition, you can. But I have a few rituals. Um, two socks, similar, okay. similar to what you said. That's definitely one of them. Um, and then, like having this really specific uh, dynamic warm up, like before I bowl. Like I remember back in the day, some of my teammates would call me a diva because they were like, "Dude, if you don't like, if you don't do that, you just feel like you can't bowl." Um, but I'll tell you something interesting. I've I've had occasions where I haven't been able to do that dynamic warm up, and I've I've even bowled in like Air Jordans and. I remember like bowling after six balls, I felt completely fine. I felt normal. And, and I remember in that split moment thinking to myself, have I, have I been cheating myself my whole life? That thinking I have to do all of these things beforehand when I feel just as good right now and I haven't done any of those things. So, oh, yeah. Oh, mate, that's brilliant. <laughs> I, that's, that's what I love about these questions because it gets people thinking. And to be honest with you, it's 10 times better than someone just giving me a straight answer question, just being like, no, when they definitely did when they were younger. Everyone <laughs> suffers from that. So, no, so obviously, guys, we enough with, with the funny stuff. On to serious session. No, I'm joking. So, um, getting us off and starting us off, just for anyone who doesn't know you, who's been living under a rock, okay? <laughs> Can you give us a little bit of bit, a bit about your background, obviously playing, and then obviously the start of the Peace Journal and on to where we are today? Yeah, sure. So um, I, like many other cricketers out there, I play. I grew up playing age group county cricket for Berkshire, Middlesex, and then I was signed by Northamptonshire in around 2009. Um, I was signed just at the end of the 2009 season, um, and then literally after that winter, so that pre-season period, um, I lost my contract pretty much before the start of the 2010 season. Um, after that, I went, and I'm sure we're going to get into the ins and outs of those periods in more detail. But after that, I, I went on a long sort of uh, hiatus from cricket, um, dabbled into other things, which I'm sure we'll speak about. Uh, I then returned in 2017. Um, I founded a project called Pace Journal, which is basically a platform where we deliver insights and experiences from past and present cricketers, coaches, uh, anyone who's basically done something worth knowing <laughs> in fast bowling. Um, and then, yeah, it's pretty much here I am now. It's uh, It's been, I can't believe it's been four years since we, we launched Pace Journal. It's been, I think it's five, sorry. I think it's been about five years now since we launched Pace Journal. And yeah, it's been a hell of a ride. Well, I, I, like I can, I'm someone who can actually vouch for this because I followed it from, from almost day dot. <laughs> and from from when it was just yourself and then obviously managing to and I'll and I'll get on to it in a bit more as as we will do 
obviously founding and, and collaborating then with Tamar Mills and becoming sort of co sort of coordinators, if you like, of 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 the platform, no? Yeah, yeah. Mate, that was that's unbelievable because I looked up to Tamar for a hell of a long time, and obviously yeah, based nice. on from where stuff from Essex, and then obviously his stuff into Sussex, and and moving on from then all of his journeys and stuff like that. It, it's it's amazing. So starting us off then from from when you were playing, obviously still playing, um, but when you when you had that goal of obviously becoming a professional cricketer and then having that aspiration like so many other people do. What is it like then when you're going through those age group county setups? Because I've spoken to a lot of professional cricketers and they say that they've been a bit guilty of probably feeling a bit too comfortable. And then later on, understanding that, you know, the, the hard work's got to be done, you know, at any moment, you know, some things, this thing could come to an end or you, you might not have that extra day. What yeah. was it like for you then in that setup progressing on? Um, yeah, again, a, a really good question. I guess everyone will have their own sort of individual journeys, hurdles and stuff like that. I mean, I, I think I was quite lucky in, in a weird way. Um, my, I mean, I come from a family of, of cricketers. Uh, I never really took it that seriously. It was only when a family friend, um, he, he, he basically played for Berkshire. Um, his dad said to me, oh, do you want to come and play cricket? Um, he came and picked me up, took me to the cricket club. Um, and that lad was playing, like I said, he was playing minor county cricket for Berkshire at the time. And after seeing me bowl, he, he came to the house when he dropped me off and he said to my dad, uh, uncle, um, I don't know why this boy is not playing for any clubs or anything, but I'm pretty confident that in all the county cricket that I've seen for our age, no one's bowling as quick as him. Um, and again, my dad didn't really take it that seriously. I mean, his his brothers, my uncles were quite prolific um, in, in Pakistan in terms of playing cricket. So I think he just fobbed it off like, ah, you know, he's he's all right. Like, how, how good can he really be? Um, and then... I got invited to the uh, district trial. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with that process over here. You've got that the levels are basically like school, club, district, county, region, and then it's national. Um, so district is below county. Um, and I remember going to the district trials and literally no, no word of a lie. After like three balls, the district coach came out and said, dude, um, you shouldn't be here. You should be in the county squad. And then like next week, I had a uh, I was selected to play for Berkshire against Cambridgeshire, and that was in Cambridge. It was a long, long way away. And I tell you something else that was interesting. Up until that point, I was playing like under thirteens cricket, um, and it was only like twenty overs, really short stuff. And that, that was a fifty over game, and um, that that county game was so long. I remember just being in the field thinking, "Forget this, man. This is this is boring. Like this is so long." Um, but yeah, for, but basically from that. Um, I sort of built that ambition and hunger that I wanted to basically be the fastest bowler on the planet. Like I'm sure there's millions of, of young kids out there who, you know, strive and dream of things like that. Um, so everything I did from, I'd say around 16, 17 onwards, um, you know, when I took it really, really seriously was, was all geared towards, okay, how can I be, you know, how can I be the fastest bowler in the world? Um, so I wouldn't say I, I took it, I was too comfortable or I, I had a bit of complacency. I actually think I was a victim of being overambitious um, and trying so many things to try and achieve that goal where they ended up working against me in a, in a really weird sort of way. Then how did you how did you balance that then when, when you obviously unfortunately got released then when, when you had that hiatus and you're like... Because obviously everyone probably, despite what they think, they probably do sit down and be like, right, cool, what is the reason why... I'm in this position today and I'm not still over there. Yeah, what yeah. was your sort of thought process then of being over ambitious? Because then everyone sees the hard work, the the grind and everything like that. But no one talks, a lot, a lot of people forget to talk about obviously the balance in, in having yeah. the balance between sort of hard work and then your sort of recovery and things like that. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, I, I guess to give to give more context to what I'm saying, I, I'll explain exactly what um, what issues I came across. So... I, you know, I was always obsessed with speed, wanting, wanted to know how I can bowl faster. Um, I was working with a pretty prolific fast bowling coach at the time who, who helped me a lot. Um, and together we would, you know, discuss loads of different avenues that we could explore. Um, you know, avenues such as baseball, um, javelin. And I actually went out to um, South Africa, Potchefstroom in South Africa uh, for nine days. And, and whilst I was out there, I don't know if you've ever been to Poch, but it's Never. like a... Yeah, it's like a haven for elite athletes. Like right. it, it, it's nine thousand feet above sea level, so it's high altitude. Um, the place over there is called the High Performance Institute of Sport. It's just like if you could think of a dream facility 
to, to train at, it's it's Poch in South Africa. And when we were out there, there were there were like Olympic javelin throwers there, but also the world record holder of the javelin throw, Jan Zelezny. His one of his coaches were there as well. His name his name is Tertius Liebenberg. And we basically got speaking to this gentleman and, and I remember sitting down in his office and showing him a video of Brett Lee and Shreve Akhtar and, and saying, you know, what would you do to make these guys quicker? And he, he, he understood cricket anyway. Like he, he likes cricket and he knew of Brett Lee and Shreve Akhtar. And he, he was giving us some insights on what he feels they could do better. Uh, and I guess I just kind of ran with that and it, it really consumed me. And, and I started to play loads of experiments with my bowling action in terms of changing the way I jump, changing the positions at back to contact, um, changing the, the way I move through the crease. And in the process of doing those things, I, I lost my natural ability to bowl. Um, and it's a really strange thing to explain to someone who, who hasn't kind of been through the same, same thing. Um, and then I came back in, I think it was like around Feb, March time, and the academy director of North France at the time, David Ripley, he obviously wanted to see what I've been getting up to, right? He wanted to know, like, dude, you need to come in and train. We need to see how you, you know, how you are ahead of the season. And I was making all sorts of excuses under the sun, things like to, to, to not go there. Because I was like, if I go there, I can't even bowl a ball properly. So I'm like, if I go there, what, what am I going to say to them? And at the time, I was, I was 19 years old as well. So, you know, naive mindset at the time, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, what can I possibly say that's going to make sense? I'm, I can't imagine rocking up and saying, hey, I forgot how to bowl. So I was like, you know, what sort of answer is that? So I was just making loads of excuses like, oh, I'm injured. I've got this. Something like that is going on. Um, and this is um, the first time ever I'm going to confess, confess this. At one stage, it, it was in the morning of a, a fitness testing day. I actually walked to the, to the edge of the motorway and, and I rang David and I said, oh, the, um, the, the car broke down and just so it sounded legit because you could hear like cars going past yeah. but I was that frightened of going back there and then it got to a stage where I couldn't I couldn't kind of lie anymore I needed to kind of face up and, and tell him that look something is wrong so I, I basically told him I was having some family issues at the time um, which were kind of true as well and then he told me to come down and he, he was amazing man like uh, just on just going off on a tangent quickly, you know when all this um, sort of racism and cricket thing erupted, I, I actually sent David Ripley a message privately, and, and I said to him like, David, look, I know the game's getting a lot of stick, a lot of coaches are getting a lot of stick, but I just want to say thank you because you were amazing. Like, the can I swear on it? Yeah, go on. Like the the shit I put this guy through, <laughs> like I was like, dude, you gave me fair chances. Like, I really appreciate you. And obviously, I, w I was getting paid monthly at the time. And he literally took me to the county ground and he, he opened up to me and he told me about his own struggles, which obviously I'm, I can't mention, but he told me some pretty personal stuff. And, and he was just telling me that, look, I understand Shabazz because I've gone through similar things myself. Um, so what he said to me is that we'll put you on compassionate leave um, so you can continue, obviously, getting your monthly payments. But he, 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 I remember him saying, I can't do that forever. So you need to whatever's going on you need to get it sorted fairly soon um and i tried so hard for like two years um but pretty much after like three months i, I just remember the, the payments from north Hampshire stopped and i didn't even again at the time i didn't even think to contact them or, or i just i kind of left it. it was a very very immature period of my life in terms of how i dealt with with the whole situation but i was just really trapped man i felt suffocated in in the sense that what, what do i say how do I communicate what I'm going through? And on top of it all, James, I was very, very hurt because if I had if I had lost my game because I was busy partying or, do you know what I mean, like messing around or something, I'd be great. I was training three times a day every single day. So I'm like, man, this is just so unfair. Like, I'm training harder than everyone that I know and, and I'm going through this. So, yeah, I hope that puts a bit of context into you know, how, you know, all of these issues happened in terms of what happened to me. That, that's where I'd say overambition is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it will drive you to commit yourself to make sacrifices. But it's a curse because when you literally put every single egg in that basket, if something goes wrong, you kind of have nowhere to turn. You're, you're facing a brick wall and you're like, well, where do I go from here?
do you reckon it was a case of of quantity over quality in a certain sense where you where you knew exactly what you were doing in regards to sort of working on your on your technique on like you said your back foot contact front foot contact whether it's sort of uh, I don't know sort of alignment at the crease whatever it may be but then you were doing so much of it that you didn't obviously give yourself time to almost I don't know like reevaluate but go back to the drawing board and you were just you were focusing so much on 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 how much you can change rather than understanding what you actually did quite well. Yeah, I, I actually, um, to, to be really, really honest with you, I, I think it was more lack of direction. Um, um, and again, I'm always very careful when I speak about this because I don't want to offend, you know, my past coaches or anything like that. And, and I, by no means do I hold people responsible for how my career turned out. But I remember at the time, the things that we were sort of uncovering from the javelin world they they were very new to cricket. Like no one was no one was talking about this stuff. And and at the time, I also recognised this because my coaches were all ears. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's like now when when a bowler works with me, when they're speaking to me, a lot of this stuff I've, I've tried it, so I've got a baseline understanding of what they're saying. But a lot of the stuff that we were hearing at that time, no one had tried these things. So even the coaches that I w was working with, they didn't really have. Um, an A to Z understanding of, of these, you know, theoretically the stuff made sense, but from a practical point of view, this wasn't tried and tested. So that, I think that is where it cost me a lot because I, I didn't really have direction. I didn't have anyone say to me, do this and then stop. You need to stop that and do this now. Um, and I think that's, that's where it, it really cost me. I, I think quality... Yes, quality over quantity is a big thing, but it, even like the training that I was doing, man, it was it was very specific. Like I didn't really waste much time. Um, it was the direction. What I really needed was someone to step in and say, "You're going overboard with this. Just rein it in and and, and just get back on this track." Um, so I was pretty much going at it alone and reporting all of my findings back to coaches and stuff like that. Is that why you felt you needed a little bit of a hiatus then after all that had stopped? No, I'd say the hiatus came from just simply having enough, man. Like, it just, it, you know, when you play, when you play a sport for fun, you, you really enjoy it. And I remember my brother's business partner, Fadil, his name, he's an amazing guy. Uh, he was a mentor of mine at the time. And I remember speaking to him and I said, because he asked me, he was like, you know, when was the moment you, you decided that you needed to have that hiatus? And I said, I remember I was out on a, um, I was playing a match for Dinton at the time. And I was standing in the field and I was watching everyone and they're all smiling. They're all having fun. And I remember my heart was just beating. And I'm like, and it, the realization hit me that everyone is here having fun. Whereas I'm here basically fighting for my life or for survival. In my head, I'm thinking, if I don't get this right, am, am I going to be homeless? Like, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to be, you know, what, what, what's my job going to be? I'm, I was really panicking in that sense. So I, I kind of needed a break from it because... The more I thought about where I was at, the more I thought about where I needed to go, it was just weighing down on me as this really impossible mountain to climb. And how did you sort of disattach yourself? Because was it an immediate, like, I need to, like, disattach myself? Or was it, like, a gradual, you stopped yeah. training sort of as much daily, and then you kind of just sort of decided, right, now I'm going to stop now for a bit? I was actually, yeah, that's another very interesting... Um, point because I, I I'm, I'm very lucky in the sense that I at the time I was quite good friends with well, I still am he's one of my best friends um, a strength and conditioning coach called Ruben Tabares I don't know if you've ever heard of him I mean he's he's trained some prolific athletes um, world champion boxers like Amir Khan um, David wow. Hay Derek Zora Dillian White um, he, he trains footballers he trains like super super high level athletes and at the time I was spending a lot of time with 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 Ruben and I was always obsessed with like branding, advertising, just human communication in general. And I was sort of spending a lot of time with him and just helping him out with certain projects and stuff like that. So it gave me a little bit of a um, distraction, if you know what I mean. So I wasn't sitting there just like twiddling my thumbs thinking about fast bowling. I, I was with Ruben pretty much every day and you know, he was training these amazing athletes. So that was quite inspirational for me as well. Just watching, you know, how the heavyweight champion of the world, goes about his training and then literally would leave that and there's a, a rapper called Tiny Temper. I don't know if you've ever heard of yeah, that yeah. guy. So he Ruben was training Tiny at the time. 
So I was literally like around these really amazing people. Um, but I'll tell you something interesting. Everywhere I would go, people would always associate me with cricket and fast bowling, which, again, I was trying to shake off this identity of Shabazz the athlete. But it was like, no matter how much I tried, everywhere I would go, people would recognize me as that. So I remember just going on a, on a bender in the sense that I was eating all sorts of rubbish. I was trying to like, I thought to myself, if I get really fat, maybe this is just my excuse, James, putting on weight. But I was thinking, if I get really fat, people will, will kind of not ask me about sport because they'll probably look at me and think, yeah, he, probably, he doesn't play anymore. Um, because it was hurtful, man. Everywhere I went, everyone would ask me, how's cricket? How's bowling? Like, are you, you know, are you, um, are you where you want to be and stuff like that? And I was trying to run away from that almost to the point where I was avoiding people because I didn't want to face those questions. Yeah. And is that, is that sort of how you then sort of decided to put out all your stuff then on, on Pace Journal? Because then obviously if you're being asked about all of these things about how everything's going, I suppose it was almost a sense of, right, I might as well get it out so then everyone knows. So people start asking me, is that, it sounds weird, but is that kind of a way that it was? No, no, that, this, this all happened around, so I lost my contract in 2010, and no word of a lie, I, I grinded it out until 2012, by the way, like behind the scenes, I spent two whole years trying to figure out what went wrong and trying to correct it. And in 2012, I kind of accepted this is not going to happen. And that's when I thought, okay, hiatus is required. Um, and I left the game from that point. And then from 2012 to, two, to 2017, um, my, my brother, he, he had a tech company at the time, which is obviously where him, him and his business partner would work together. They had an office um, really like next to the house. So I'd literally be with them pretty much every day. Like they would just be working on their startup um, and I'd be sat there just, you know, watching how they build a business. So can you see like on one end, I've got Ruben Tavares training all these world champions and then I'd, I'd leave Ruben and come to my brother and Fadil and watch how they were building this startup. So I was kind of like infused in a, a completely different world. You were surrounding yourself with amazing people who are doing a lot of things. Yeah, n naturally. And that's, that's why I sound really luck lucky because naturally my environment was, it was a, a thriving environment. So I was in there and then in 2017, it's, it's kind of mad. Even when I look back, like having this conversation with you, it's, it's such a like strange sort of narrative. My, my, so my uncle, his name is Zahid Saeed. He, he was a prolific left arm fast bowler in Pakistan. Now, he, the reason he didn't play for Pakistan is because it was uh, Wazim Akram, Wakar Yunus, Shoaib Akhtar, and then it was Zahid Saeed. They're all right. They're so, all right. Very They're hard. Decent. Very hard team to break into. Um, he broke all sorts of records in, in Pakistan. And then he got selected in the uh, Pakistan squad to tour the West Indies. And I remember, I remember that day so clearly because my dad was like blasting out like these Pakistani anthems in the house. And it was such a proud moment for the family. Like, you know, my uncle finally got selected in the test squad. I think at that time, Wazir Makram was injured, by the way. So it was like he got a break. And then what happened is the sponsor of that tour pulled out. So the, 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 the actual series didn't go ahead. So what right. they decided to do was they, they turned the team into uh, a Pakistan A team and then they sent them to Kenya to play a triangular tournament with India. And my, my uncle played two matches. He played two matches against India and he got taken apart by Mahendra Singh Dhoni and Gautam Gambit. Again, not so bad, not so bad. Yeah, and, and these guys, they were playing for India A team, by the way, so they're trying to break through as well. And um, after that, my basically the selector said to my uncle that he can't handle big match pressure. And I remember my uncle was so like, like enraged by this comment because he was like, I've, I've been performing at the top for 10 years and you're going to tell me now that just because of two games, I can't handle pressure. So he, he basically, he married um, a, a lady here in England. He settled down over here. Um, and then his, his life kind of went down a different path. So that's my uncle. After my uncle, it was me. And then I've also got a first cousin. His name is Bilal Asif. Um, are you still with me, James? Yeah, yeah still with you. Um, Bilal, he's an officer. And he's got, he's got one heck of a story, by the way. Like, honestly, his story should be out in the cinema. Uh, and then Bilal, in 2017, Bilal broke Tide Afridi's record in Pakistan for the past 100 in T20 cricket. 
And coincidentally, the selector of a Pakistan team was in the stadium. Next thing you know, Bilal got selected in a Pakistan team. Oh, wow. And obviously in our family, we were like, no disrespect to Bilal, lovely, lovely guy, super, super cricketer. But no one thought that he was going to play for Pakistan. Do you know what I mean? And then when that yeah. happened, it kind of, like, it just kind of reinvigorated something in me as well. Because I was like, man, look, my, my cousin, my first cousin is playing for Pakistan. And, and I remember going to the Champions Trophy final in, at the Oval. This is 2017, where Pakistan actually beat India. Yeah. And um, after that day, my, my dad came, my brother was there, and they all sat me down, and he was like, look, man, do you want to give this another go? And I was like, yeah, why not? And I thought, if I could do, if I could do it differently in the last five years, what would I do? I mean, that, that transformation is a, a story for another day. But basically, I was going down that path of over-obsessing again. Okay. My bowling action technique. So... Pace Journal was basically a side project to stop me from going insane. I know one of the questions you had down was, was Pace Journal always thought of as a business? Yeah. It was, Pace Journal was thought of as a, a way for me to stop myself from going crazy. Um, so it, I just thought, you know what? I've learned all these skills about branding, advertising, and design. Let me just create something to keep myself distracted so that I could train and then switch off and focus on something else. And, and that was Pace Journal, and, and that's where that came about. That's why I, I actually ask a lot of sort of professional athletes this where about their balance, if they have, uh, what, what do they do in their spare time? Because and a lot of them are actually guilty, and they admit to me how they think that they actually, they think cricket, 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 or football, 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 but then obviously I think it depends on the type of person if they actually use that to their advantage or it's actually against their detriment. Yeah. So, like, for yourself yeah. then, did you ever worry that you were doing too much cricket or did you know that write this Pace Journal uh, at the time, sort of Pace Journal page, because obviously yeah. look what it's turned into now, uh, is going to sort of transition into something big? No, nah, honestly, James, no, no clue. Like, at, at, honestly, at the time, and, and, I, and I, looking back, I give myself a, a little bit of credit for being sensible enough to actually make that decision to start Pace Journal because... I and, and it was it was my it was my friend Jangir, um, and I remember sitting in this peri peri chicken shop with him, and and he, he again Jangir like he he's he was an amazing support network for me during that time, like every, all of my training, I would speak to him about it, all of my videos. Do you remember me saying to you that one of the mistakes back before was well, that I kind of went at it my own? Yeah. And this time round, like I, I didn't do it that way. Like I was always consulting with someone, and and Jangir is actually a leg spinner, so it was probably better for me because. He was a little bit naive to fast bowling, so he was really all ears and giving me honest sort of feedback and opinions versus trying to come at it from a coaching point of view. Okay. And I remember sitting in this chicken shop with him, and he, he literally said to me, Shavaz, I've just realized something. Every single day, all we do is talk about fast bowling, and it's unhealthy. And he goes, I'm just thinking about it. On the phone, fast bowling. Face to face, fast bowling. And he goes, we need to, we need to stop. And that's when I thought, okay, I need to do something else. I've learned all these skills from branding and, and the marketing side of things. And then I, I didn't want to go too far away from, from cricket as well. So I thought, what can I do which kind of blends both worlds together? And then obviously started Pace Journal and the, the balance naturally sort of arrived. Okay, so then obviously you kind of found your balance sort of, not by accident, but like sort of you made sure that you sort of created something else to have that, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it was... Um, I mean, I never thought it was going to become what it has, but at the time, I was like, and, and, and I think this is important for anyone listening as well, to try and find that balance, make sure it's something you're passionate about. Because for, for other people, that balance could be, I don't know, studying a subject which they don't really care about. And if that's the case, that's not true balance. Because true balance is when you're invested in, in the whole project. So for me, it was actually less about fast bowling at the start. It was more about the design. So at the time, I was more obsessed with how can I create a really nice logo? How can I create a really pretty color scheme? How can I create something which is marketed differently from everything else out there? And that took my mind completely off of my own bowling action. And, and that natural balance was, was so, so critical for my mental health. And then where did you sort of... You used it obviously as this sort of balance mechanism and this sort of mental health sort of manager, if you like. 
How did yeah. you then deal with it when it started to gain a little bit of traction and understand that, you know, you're like, bloody hell, I've actually got something here which is actually can, can help a lot of people? Yeah, um, so that arrived, so in the 2000, in 2017, I was 120 kilos, so I was, I was 30 kilos overweight. So I had to, like the first step in trying to play again was get fit. So that, that took a lot out of me, that six months, like just literally training, like no tomorrow. Um, and then when I played the 2018 season, it, it was very tough. Like the season was, it was a tough, tough se season for me to play. And I remember my, uh, my uncle at the time um, saying to me that, dude, your issue is not ability. Your issue is you, you've been away from the game for five years. You can't expect to walk back in mm. at, at an optimal level. You need to be playing a couple of seasons. And obviously, I'm, I'm, at the time, I was 28 years old. So I had a very important decision to make. Because at this time, we had only interviewed a handful of people on Pace Journal. But I remember sitting down and, and thinking to myself, OK, I either continue you know, chasing a career in cricket or I basically try and invest my time into building this small project, which seems to have some legs. So that, that was the turning point for me. It was the end of the 2018 season. And I thought, you know what? Let me be really, let me be really smart about this. You're 28 years old, Shabazz. Do you want to get to 30 and then be like, okay, that's another two years gone. I'm not going to make it. Or do you want to spend that time trying to build Pace Journal and see where that goes? Um, did I answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you also yeah. redirected your energy in a certain way. Sort of... Basically, basically yeah. yeah. I, I, had, I, I would think of it as I've got a limited supply of energy. Where is that going to go? And the decision I had to make, although what I had to weigh up was where, was the, where would I get the most return for my energy? Did you almost find it difficult then to sort of step away from focusing on your playing career or was it very naturally sort of directed towards Pace Journal in that sense? Good question again. Um, it was, I'll tell you what, when I, when I did things differently in the, in the comeback, everything went my way in the sense that a lot of the, the hardest thing for me in 2010, by the way, or 2012, it was the fact that I couldn't bowl. Like, that, yeah. like, that wouldn't haunt me. Like, I, I didn't even want to watch cricket because I'm yeah. like, it, like how I just missed that feeling so much. So when I came back, I got super fit, super strong. Technically, I was good. So my bowling was actually in a place where I was really content. So it wasn't that hard to, to walk away because I was... I was satisfied in my heart that I'm in a good place in terms of my bowling. Um, and then obviously with Pace Journal still being linked to fast bowling and stuff like that, um, it, it, I was still involved in... in the... You still got that sort of stimulus that way, like regardless of whether you're playing or not. 100%. So again, it comes back to that thing where I said, you've got to be passionate about it because if you're passionate about the, the subject, um, then you're, it's going to be less painful to, to switch. And then did you sort of use those lessons that you learned from your playing career towards Pace Journal? Because a lot of things which I've sort of read about you and I've, I've done myself, like they sort of kind of link into to what you, we're doing together, what we're doing together, what we're talking about here, because, you know, setting up uh, like the, the Fitness Academy, like I've done on or the podcast, for example, it takes sort of discipline because a lot of people will tend to say something and they'll start it for a little bit and they'll drop off. Whereas yourself and, and I like to think myself as well stay very consistent with it and you and you've got to you've got to know which is unbelievable and sort of one thing which I, I learned or sort of heard about you was you said you remember sort of the head coach of North Ant say, saying I will make an example to you and some of the lads who turned up late was that could you sort of relay that towards putting a post out late and then that not getting the traction as well yeah so um just uh, in what you said there earlier um I think for me, the, the work ethic that I had in my pursuit of trying to become the, you know, the best fast bowler possible, that naturally carried itself over into Pace Journal. So the, what the head coach basically said there, and for me, I, I lived in Reading, so I had to, um, and this is crazy by the way, I had, to, I had to walk to the train station, it's about 30 minutes, I had to get a train from Reading to London, Paddington. Then I'd have to take an underground from Paddington to Euston. 
then I'd have to walk five minutes from Houston Overground to Houston, no, sorry, Houston Underground to Houston Overground. Then I'd have to take a train from Houston Overground to Northamptonshire. Then I'd have to take a black cab from Northamptonshire Station to Wanted Road, which is where the stadium was. And there was a couple guys who played with me at the time. Some of them are big, by the way. I'm not going to mention any names. Some of them played for England. <laughs> okay? Okay. And some of them would arrive late to games. Uh, not to games, to, to training, sorry. I remember uh, Rich, David Ripley saying, guys, look, this is not unacceptable. This guy's having to travel like over two and a half hours to get here, and he's here early. Some of you are five minutes down the road. Um, so I think that, that work ethic, it was instilled in me simply because I wanted to be the best. And I, I carried the same sort of drive into Pace Journal, where if I'm designing a post, I want it to be the best post ever. And you'll know this yourself because you, uh, just, I've seen the way you've been going back and forth with me, the consistency. You have to be very relentless in the yeah. sense that you can't really compromise on your standards. If, if, you, if you're going to try and achieve something, if you've got a high standard for it, there is no excuse. You have to literally sacrifice everything to try and make that a realisation. And even if it's, and, it, and it's difficult, that one thing that you, talk, that, that you mentioned just there, a lot of people, things that a lot of people don't see is, is that they think, oh, he just put out a post, it takes five minutes. It takes a good amount of time to plan a post, to think about what you're going to do, and then, and then find out how that helps someone else, because I was guilty of it in the past, that just putting out content, just putting out content and actually not understanding how it could actually help someone, not necessarily find a niche, because what I like to do is try and help as many people as possible. Um, but almost in a way, try and find out how it can help as many people as possible in the right way. So if it's a post about nutrition, find out how can I help someone who's sort of having an eating disorder or someone who potentially is a bit overweight. Or, and then understand that I, I, I can't help 10,000 people at once, that I can probably focus one day at a time to focus different people. So, for example, with a podcast, you know, a lot of people say, well, James, you call the Fitz Academy podcast and you're having someone about cricket on. How does that relate to a certain way? But then it, it, fit, fitness or like... Uh, the, the way I like to do things is very all-rounded and it's based about di people, different journeys about how I can, how you, some of your words have 110% help, not me, or not just me, sorry, everyone else as well as listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, like, just to go back on that, that point you made, even there, for me, the, the big thing from the outset with Pace Journal, and, and, and this, I guess this is where my intentions were and still are very pure, I wanted to, I, I looked back at myself and I thought, and I remember, I remember my uncle at the time, he would, he would say things to me that I would just ignore because I'm like naive at the time, you know, I've got these great coaches in my corner. They're not telling me the things that my uncle's telling me. So I would ignore my uncle. Um, and then afterwards I realized that the, the world is quite a, uh, quite an ignorant place. And, and I even put myself in this category, by the way. <laughs> If I had not achieved, I don't like saying that because I like to think of myself as a humble person. If I hadn't have achieved the things that I have, how much merit would someone actually give to what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So from the outset, I was like, there are going to be millions of young bowlers like me out there who are going to make the same rookie errors. So how can I stop that from happening? Like, genuinely, like my heart was going out to these people like, and I'm spending a lot of time on my personal Instagram page, like messaging people, telling them like, stop doing this. Trust me, don't do this. You're going to mess yourself up. And then ultimately they're still doing it. And I'm thinking the only reason they're not actioning my words is because I'm Shabazz Jadri who, who didn't make it. And until Shoaib Akhtar or Tamar Mills says it, they're not going to take it seriously. So I was like, yeah. in order to protect these people, I need to bring very credible voices to the to the forefront. So literally all of my interviews at the start, they were kind of centered around protection. So I'm asking qualified bowlers. I, I, I'll give you a classic one. Um, a lot of a lot of what you will see in the amateur game is bowlers um, checking their speed with speed guns and coaches telling them their speed. And I remember doing I remember this crushing, like even crushed me at one stage and I remember asking Jofra Archer, like, you know, I, do you care about speed and stuff? He was like, no. And I remember, say, I remember there was a video of Tamal Mills bowling and someone was holding a speed gun. And I sent him the video and I said, oh, Tamal, I'm just curious. What did the speed gun reading say? And he goes, Shabazz, I've never seen that video in my life. And um, I don't know what it said. 
And I was like, well, did you never check these things? He was like, no. So I thought, look at the difference. The, the, real, the real fast bowlers, they don't actually pay too much attention to the things that the amateur bowlers are obsessing over. Yeah. So I thought, I need, to, I need to bring these concepts and way, you know, professionalism to the forefront so amateur bowlers can look and think, actually, this guy has got credibility and he's saying this, so we should, you know, we should maybe take this seriously. Well, like, so almost if you look at it, to who, two of the best, it, well, statistically, two, uh, two of the best fast bowlers to ever grace the earth, earth which is well, even fast bowlers or seam bowlers, Stuart Broad and James Anderson. Yeah. And even sort of obviously filming today uh, is when obviously England wraps up the series against South Africa at home. You know, yeah. someone like an Ollie Robertson, who statistically is not coming across being like, I'm bowling 85, 90 mile an hour blasters down there. And but I'm still picking up wickets and you're still getting wickets in that sense. And you look at someone like Nokia, who, uh, who was on the other opposition team, wasn't getting them wickets towards the end because... Nowadays, you would think that, and I, and I think you have to be quite naive to understand that batters are bloody good nowadays, and they know how to sort of manipulate those those fast bowlers and, and use that pace. And, and sort of, how was it for you in understanding that when, when you're having that conversation with them? Because, again, like as they've gone on, and I've heard Tamal say it a few times, sort of off air, that you know, batsmen are really good. You're going to have times where they're going to win. Simple yeah, as that. I think nowadays, the way the game has evolved, the higher the speed, the higher the risk. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I was having an argument with my uncle about this today, funnily enough, um, because he, he's obviously old school. And I was, I was telling him that, look, back in the day, if you bowled 90 miles an hour, like people genuinely struggled to play yeah. it. And I was like, uncle, nowadays, you bowl 90 miles an hour, guys are getting down on one knee and, and... Sc- scooping you over the head. And I, and I was like, do you honestly think it's easier to play fast bowling now? than it was before. And he was like, um, no, um, it, it was harder back then to, to play fast bowling. And um, no, sorry, sorry, I got horribly wrong. Yeah, he was, got, yeah, the, he was oh. saying that it, it's um, back in the day, the, the, the batters were better or something like that. And I said, I said, no, nah, man. I was like, look, it's, it's, easy. it's the way that these batters are playing 150 now. Like, it's a joke. Like, yeah. and I said, just the facilities, the resources that people have now, speed, it used to be this really, yeah. really big asset. Now it's almost, it's almost a, um, it's a bit of a, a liability, man. It's yeah. Vulnerable. Like you get an edge at ninety mile an hour, it's more, more than likely it's going for six. That's that's. That, you, it's funny you mention that because, uh, like, obviously speaking on like today, um, uh, the which is obviously it, well, it's a Monday now. Uh, so obviously the day before was it yesterday? I released a podcast with Fast Bowler from Sorry Conomica. And he kind of said that how he has to kind of almost like as if a batsman plays every ball by its merit. He needs to bowl every ball to to, to whatever whatever's happened the next one because he said yeah. he was playing the game the day before we actually recorded and he said oh well I uh, uh, I I got a play in a miss I bowled him and then the next the next ball I bowled the gun bumper and it went for six <laughs> and he top edged it for six so he kind of I like the mentality he has where he's just like well it happened and he, he pushed on so. Uh, again, like, and we can use that to uh, a million and one different things, like whether that be in, in business or in like w- when we're talking about what we're doing now. But like, f- for you, does it is it all about sort of what's happening in the moment rather than what's what's gone or what's coming up in two weeks' time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd agree. Uh, and the the funny thing is, um, again, my mentor, you know, when I early days learning about business. Uh, you know, you, you may have heard of this, the, the five-year projection or the five-year yeah. forecast, something like that. And I remember speaking to him about this, and he, he looked and he, he was like, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah. He goes, would you let the 15-year-old you dictate the 20-year-old you? And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And he goes, just think back to your mindset and maturity at the age of 15, and then think out how, how much it would have evolved at the age of 20. So he was like, how can you possibly be making plans for five years down the line? Well, so much can change, um, especially now in the, in the era that we live in with the technological advancements, social media, all this sort of stuff. You know, I think you have to be in the present. I think it's really good to have a vision for where you want to be in the future. But it, that has to be very, very soft and, 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 and adaptable because you can't predict what's going to happen. Like, what happens tomorrow if Facebook dies? Do you know what I mean? 
Mm. Like, do you know how many people are going to be scratching? Even me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, we were scratching our head thinking, what do we do now? Yeah. So, yeah, I think you have a have an idea of what the vision and of, of the future looks like, but that can't be rigid and set in stone. Yeah, well, that's, that's one thing I wanted to go on to next because, like you said, you've had all these different mentors and people who have, have spoken to you or, or you've looked up to, and, and, and your dad is quite is one of them, isn't he? And he said sort of, I remember reading something, you said your dad has um, played a silent role sort of in so someone looking from the inside. I was thinking about it, he played an, actually an enormous role but it never made sense that your dad worked so much, had two jobs, day and night. How yeah. did this impact you both from what you do today and sort of your work that you did when you were trying to make it professional? Because obviously, like you said, training three times a day, doing them hours to try and get to training, you know, how did his influence sort of help you both, again, what you were doing back then and versus what you're doing now, having to sacrifice those times by planning the post, doing the post? Yeah, I think, um, again, I, I think support networks in general don't get enough credit. Um, obviously, I my support network, you know, massive part of that was my, my father, um, even my mother, man. Like, my dad working all those jobs, my mum was the one who used to take me to training. And even sometimes I look back at some of my old footage, and I just see my mum in the back, like, just standing there. And um, it's, again, it... it I'm very blessed that I had incredible support in all of the things I've ever tried to do. Uh, you, you never hear me say I'm self-made um, because I, I wasn't, man. Like I was, a, I was a product of a lot of sacrifice, a lot of commitment, a lot of investment from, from people around me. Um, but what I will say is at the time, I never really appreciated all the things that my, my dad was doing for me. Um, only... Only when I got older and had to try and make a pound for myself did I appreciate that, man, you know what? My, my dad worked very, very hard and literally left no stone unturned to give me whatever I needed to try and succeed. E even to the point where, you know, are you a fast bowler, by the way, James? Yes, I am, um, yes. So you, you would have heard of the whole drag the back foot. Yes. Yeah. So I remember at the time everyone was talking about dragging the back foot and there were these... Uh, these specific fast bowling shoes, they were they were made from a guy called Ian Mason in, in Birmingham. He made Shoei Bakhtar shoes, Waka Yunus, Michael Holding, Alan Donald, um, and they cost 500 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they had this like steel plate on the back foot for you to drag your foot. And I remember, again, naive kid thinking, maybe that's going to help me drag that back foot better. So I'll tell my dad, oh, I need to get these shoes. These shoes are sick. Um, they're made from kangaroo leather and all of this. And, you know, didn't even flinch, man. Like, you know, took me there, got me the shoes. Just, just You know, at the time, as a kid, you're, I'm not, I haven't appreciated that this guy, and he's not wealthy at all. Like, I said, this guy, and my dad always used to say to me, I came into this country with 50 pounds, and all I knew was to, how to say hello. And, and, I look, and when I look at what he's achieved, I think to myself, he's the real Don. Like, I haven't done anything. I haven't even scratched the surface to what he's done. Um, so just looking back at that, and I think to myself, how lucky was I that I had someone who would literally do whatever whatever I needed to do, even cost for coaching. I mean, I remember I had a um, an international cricketer, Keswick Williams, play for West Indies. Um, he, he was literally living with me for the last six weeks. And I, I, I would go to the fruit market in the morning and I'd pick up like fresh fruit and veg to juice for Keswick before he even woke up. And I remember like leaving there and I, I got a bit emotional and I, I was telling my missus and she was like, what's up? And I said, I'm just thinking that, you know, what I'm doing for Keswick today, like, my dad used to do this for me. And I remember he used to work a night shift in the bakery and before coming home, he would literally drive to the fruit market and he would say to the guy, before you put those, that's that, that um, box of oranges on the stall let me buy it off you because I want the freshest for my son and just it, and, and how that shaped my how that shaped my work ethic moving forward is whenever times get hard I think to myself I have to justify the sacrifices and the commitment that all of these people in my support network have, have done for me so like you said 
and you'll notice yourself in trying to build your own project, you're going to have times where things are great and you're going to, more often than not, you're going to have times where it's a proper struggle. And, it's not. and in those little dips, when you feel like you haven't got the energy or the motivation, that's when I, I think back to, man, listen, my, my, the people that sacrifice so much for me, am I just going to like let that go in vain or am I going to use it as fuel to keep me going? No, just that remember why you actually started the process in the first place, because obviously they inspired you to obviously carry on doing that. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I think that's important as well. Like, you you got to, you know, my my dad, he he probably outdone his dad, you know, my, my grandfather. So I'm in my head, I'm thinking I need to do more, you know, than what my dad has done to, to make him feel like, yeah, my sacrifices were uh, justified. So, yeah, you, you want to you want to continue that legacy. That's brilliant, right? So, uh, talking about legacy, sort of, what what's the next for for the Pace Journal then? Because obviously, we've seen some, you've been doing some unbelievable stuff, and and trust me, we're going to leave all the links in the description, guys, so you can go and check it out for yourself. Um, but what's next for you guys? Because you've just um come off of doing a a, a huge event, um, with obviously England's uh, head strength and conditioning coach as well, which obviously I follow quite closely, Tamal himself, and a load of international sort of coaches. So, so what's next for you guys, and then what's next for yourself as well? Yeah, um, and you know what? You're you're gonna you're gonna come across the same hurdle that I I'm currently at, and it's basically, you know, what do you do next? Like I remember the, when I started the page, it, you know, it was a, a distraction for me to stop myself from going insane about about my bowling technique, and then it became all right. I want to get to ten thousand followers. Then it became twenty thousand. Then thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, and then it was like, you know what? No one's ever created a fast bowling anthem for fast bowlers. I'm going to go make a song when I did that. Then it, there's so many things, write a book, um, launch a, um, launch an event. Um, we're in, we're in the middle of talking about a fast bowling product with a very big company at the moment, which we're prototyping actually at the moment. Awesome. Um, poor Tamal's having to bowl with that. And he, we're getting plenty of pictures of <laughs> bloody, bloody toes and bloody socks. Um, because he's putting them through, through their faces. So I guess in terms of what's next, I can't really answer because I don't know. Um, okay. But what I do know is we're going to continue, obviously, trying to serve as many fast bowlers as possible. And I guess the, the challenge we have is how do you do that and keep things fresh? Because you know it's a, re it's a really tough battle because the way social media changes as well. You know, I remember when reels wasn't a thing and everyone yeah. then, uh, everyone's telling me, oh, you've got to post reels. And then I'm like, well, that's not really our thing. Like, our identity is not really posting videos and stuff like that so you then question your own integrity and your own ethics like shall i scrap what i was doing and, and now do this um yeah. so all i know for sure is whatever we do it's going to be down the the line of trying to help as many fast bowlers as possible and from a creative point of view it's trying to do that in in a fresh way which is engaging and, and still quite modern brilliant mate and obviously i'm looking forward to watching that myself obviously seeing following from 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 day one seeing where you get to mate so and then final final question is is because not normally we ask sort of who's your biggest role model is but obviously you've answered that well and truly and, and more than i could ever imagine um but what what's one piece of advice for anyone who wants to be the next sort of fast bowler or sort of the, the best fast bowler um because although sort of you said you may not be the professional it doesn't mean that you're you know up there mate definitely not don't put yourself down um and then or anyone who wants to be the next uh shabazz child be starting up something which can help all these people um so my the, the best piece of advice that i that i've been given again it's it was from my friend uh Jangir, and he just always reminds me of just count your blessings and, and the, re I'll, the reason I say that is because, you know, running, running all of, running Pace Journal, managing a coaching business, um, there, it's very stressful, and sometimes that stress can be quite overwhelming, and a lot of the times, um, I'm like, I'm not angry, but I'm frustrated, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm, I'm naggy, and Jangir will just, you know, remind me that Shabazz, listen, it could be a lot worse, so. Um, and then again, it's just that appreciation and, and that gratitude. And I guess, you know, and I, I've been lucky enough to coach so many different fast bowlers now. One of my, one of my players, his name is Cameron Cooper. Um, he actually plays for the England disability team. Um, and he okay. plays in Yorkshire. And he has two 50-degree curves in his spine. 
So you know, like a normal, okay. a, no a normal spine would kind of goes straight. So Cameron's spine goes out like that and, and back in. So okay. you can imagine how challenging his life is. And I remember when I, when I first trained him, I'm no worried about it. This guy was breaking all sorts of records. Like he, we did yeah. a 30 meter um, max sprint test and he was like top three out of all my athletes. And I've got international athletes in my uh -huh. roster. And I'm like, and I remember at the time, again, it made me emotional because I was like, Cameron, like you're, you're, you're the guy, man. Like you've got all these limitations, but you haven't, you haven't allowed them to stop you. Like you found a way. And then, then I think to myself, Shabazz, how lucky are you that you don't have those limitations put upon you? The camera didn't, he didn't yeah. grow up wanting to have, and by the way, he wasn't born like that. It's something that develops. So, you know, if you're a fast bowler out there and you can even bowl a ball, listen, count your blessings because there's someone out there who, prob who probably doesn't have lower limbs and they can't bowl. Or there's someone out there who they can't play cricket because they've got to support their family. Um, so they can't, even, they can't even play. They're too busy working. So if, you, if you're lucky enough to even be able to put a ball in your hand and bowl it, just count your blessings and just be, appreciate that you're able to do something that millions and millions of people would wish and pray that they can do. Uh, honestly, that, for me, that's the best piece of advice because regardless of the level you get to, it just keeps you grounded and it, 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 that's what helps me sort of keep going. I've lost my words. Lost my... <laughs> and obviously, like, another one, like, and I'm not going to sort of keep you for any much longer, but understanding that no struggle, no story, that's one thing which you live by quite a lot, isn't it? That's one thing which I sort of found quite sort of impactful myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, carry on, mate. Go, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> again, I think a lot of the times people spend a lot of their, their livelihood uh, in the safe zone. Um, and, and that's easy, you know, that's comfortable. Like even, even what I did, I, and I remember this, when I, you know, when I went down this road of playing experiments in my bowling action, I, I was in South Africa at the time. Um, and I had to make a decision because we were planning my preseason whilst I was there. And I, I rang my brother and I said, bro, listen, you know, I've got two options. Option one, I'd stay with what I'm doing and basically just, you know, go and try and play county cricket and, you know, I probably won't get a lot of time to work on my action because a cricket schedule is pretty hectic. If you're playing three, four days a week, when, when are you going to get the time to change things? Or, or shall I try and, you know, change my action in hope that it's going to make me quicker and train and stuff like that? And I remember him saying to me, um, what did he say? He said, if you, don't, if you don't take big risks, you don't get big rewards. And now I'm going to say it's all my brother's fault. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, basically, what, what I'm trying to say is that the struggle that all of that came, you know, caused me, it also created the narrative of my story. And I think I would, in, I would encourage, and I say this with, with, with all the young kids that I train, that you've got this opportunity to step out of your comfort zone and, you know, dare to be great. Do it. Don't. And it doesn't, that doesn't mean changing a bowling action. That could be something as simple as you're bowling the last over and in a final and you know you're you're either going to try and be brave and bowl a knuckleball or a slower ball or you're just going to stick to what you you always do the struggle comes from taking risks and being brave uh, and I, and i believe that without taking those risks the the story isn't as as sweet or as interesting oh, what a way to finish ladies and gents that's <laughs> unbelievable mate so pleasure, mate. uh guys this has been an unbelievable episode. It's probably been one of the longest ones, but definitely one of the ones I've enjoyed most for sure. So everyone, please head down into the link in the description and check out Shabazz, whether it's for the Pace Journal or with his own coach and stuff that's going on. Uh, and thank you so much, mate, for coming on. Unbelievable. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure, man. Thank no you way. very, very much for uh, sticking with me through getting all this over the line. No, it's been worth it, 110%. So thank you very, very much, guys, for listening as well. Take care. Cheers, man.